Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Dennis Prager Show. And we have a scientist addressing the issue. He is Douglas Axe. He has a Ph.D., director of the Biologic Institute, a nonprofit research organization launched by Discovery Institute in Seattle. And he uh, did his undergraduate at UC Berkeley, doctor, doctoral work at Caltech, postdoctoral and research scientist positions at the University of Cambridge, the Cambridge Medical Research Council Center, and the Babraham Institute in Cambridge. His work, uh, the reason I'm doing this whole long bio is so you'll understand his science credentials. His work and ideas have been featured in such scientific journals as the Journal of Molecular Biology, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and Nature. You can't get more prestigious than those three. Dr. Douglas Axe, welcome to the Dennis Prager Program. Thank you for having me. I am delighted. Douglas Axe, by the way, Axe is A-X-E. The book is Undeniable. It's a great title. Undeniable, How Biology Confirms Our Intuition That Life is Designed. The book is up at DennisPrager.com. Undeniable. That's right, undeniable. That is your claim. It is undeniable. Did you start out with this belief that it was uh, designed, life? I, you mean starting out life or starting yes, out the book? starting out life. Well, you know, <clears throat> I can't recall what my thinking was as a young child. Um, I was not raised in a church attending home, and I don't think I ever found, in fact, I can say with confidence, I never found the evolutionary story to be plausible, but I don't think I spent a lot of time worrying about it. And then as an undergraduate, I started to really think about these two alternative uh, stories about life, that it is something that God made, being the one story, which I favored, and the alternative uh, being that it's basically an accident, that we are cosmic accidents. And I saw those two things in conflict. Uh, I had no doubt about what I believed. Um, and I just saw an opportunity to do science, to test the alternative. And so that's what I ended up doing. My uh, older brother uh, is a, a physician. He's a professor of medicine at Columbia, and he, he went to Harvard Medical School. And I only mention this so that people will again see scientific credentials. And he, I'll never forget when he was there, and he said to me, his younger brother, who, by six years, and he said, you know, I looked in the microscope, I saw the cell... And I thought, that this is just, it's too complex to have just happened on its own. Is that the sort of thing that happened to you? I, I think um, one of the things I bring out in the book is something called the universal design intuition. And this is broadly acknowledged. It's not, I gave it that name, but it's broadly acknowledged that from a very early age, two or three, we start to look at, we meaning everyone, we look at living things and attribute them to a godlike designer. So I had that all along. What emerged later was the idea that um, one could defend that intuition. Because, of course, when we reach our teen years, you go off to high school, you go off to college, people start to say, well, yes, we have the intuition, but that's just an intuition. If you do science carefully, you see that Darwin had the correct explanation and the intuition is wrong. So um, it occurred to me only later, I was really a graduate student, when it occurred to me that it would be possible to go into the lab and um, do the sorts of experiments that would tell you which of these two is right. Is the intuition right or is the uh, Darwinian story right? It turns out that the intuition is right, but uh, in approaching the book, I wanted not just to give people a simple explanation of technical science, but to show that you can do very simple, the sort of simple science that we all do every day, which I call common science, that shows the intuition is correct. That give an, ex give an example. An example of um, common science or yes. of the intuition? Yeah, either way. But, but you, you just said you know, things that we do daily using scientific uh, logic, and, and uh, that would show a person why design is more likely. Yeah, so I mean, just in terms of um, explaining what I mean by common science, I say in the book that um, we are all model builders. If you've had children or if you've been around babies from before the first, their first birthday, they are watching how things move. They're getting a model of balance and gravity. 
They have notions of color. They have, even before they have words to assign to categories, they know what a cat is, they know what a dog is, and you can parade a thousand cats and dogs before them and they'll know which are cats and which are dogs. They may not even have the word cat and dog yet, but they have these categories. So all of these things are observation of data, and we start doing this from birth, and model building and then testing the models and refining the models. So I give several examples of this in the book, but we're basically all scientists. We do that form of science from the cradle and we keep doing it. And this design intuition comes out of that is what I argue in the book. And not only that, you can test this science, you can put it to a common sense, common sense. Well, that's what the the atheists, uh, at least the vigorous atheists, that's what they deny. They say it's untestable, the design thesis. It actually is testable. And uh, in other words, you can, you can put a, a, you can construct a logical argument that shows that it can't be wrong. So maybe it's provable. Maybe that's a better, maybe that's an even stronger and better term to use. Um, we can't rerun history and see what happened in history. So that's true. Um, Darwin's theory is testable and refutable, and you can show, and we've done that in the lab for 25 years. We've been going to the lab, looking at what can happen when accidental changes happen to genes and trying to determine whether the sorts of transitions, new, new functions, new inventions can happen by accident, and they can. So it is testable. Darwin's theory is testable, and we've shown that by falsifying it. It, it does not stand up to the test. I'm claiming that the design intuition is actually provable by simple logic, simple common sense logic. So answer me this. I, I believe uh, in design, okay? Uh, so yep. I'm telling everybody my, my if, if they will, if that's the word that they want, my bias to begin with. But the, if that's true, and if what you just said is true, that uh, Darwin is disprovable, then we are in a very precarious position in in the world because it means that the overwhelming majority of scientists have been corrupted. True. It's a very, um, um, and I'm not sure, and I, I don't know of anyone who's done the sort of survey that would need to be done where you very carefully protect the identities of the people being surveyed, I'm not sure if such a survey were, were done among life scientists, what fraction of them honestly, in their heart of hearts, believe that life can be an accident and, and what fraction of them um, are highly skeptical of that. I suspect that there's more skepticism than we realize um, toward the Darwinian story. What happens is in the sciences, as in every human sphere, politics comes into play and peer pressure comes into play. And people are afraid, scientists are afraid to uh, speak out against orthodoxy because scientists get punished for speaking out against this particular orthodoxy. I have to admit uh, to you, my dear listeners, that I am in one of those positions in life that every so often happens where I don't quite understand why people would assume that everything is random. It would strike me that if somebody had not been educated in any science whatsoever, but they were intelligent and literate and given n- nothing about Darwin and nothing about evolution and nothing about God and nothing about design, nothing, and just say, look at the world, do you think it happened on its own? Everything did. That we went from rocks uh, to Beethoven with no design, or do you think there was a design, I think that 99% of people would, would say there was a design. You have to learn that there's no design. Now, you said, Douglas Axe, that there are, there are simple tests that one could use or you have used to show design. And I asked you for an example, but I don't think I got any. Well, I corrected. I, I said that I think that Darwin's claim is testable and my uh, evidence for that is that I've tested it. We spent 25 years testing it. To say that, I guess you could say, design would be testable in this sense. If someone could come up with an accidental um, way to get inventions, then that would refute the design. Oh, okay. So in other words, you're saying there are tests to show, to refute 
randomness, which right. thereby implies, because there's no other possible implication, that there's design. Correct. And in, in theory, if someone could go out and show, and there have been these claimed demonstrations. I mean, Richard Dawkins did a demonstration in The Blind Watchmaker where he used gibberish letters and he evolved them to get a line from Shakespeare. And he thinks it is like a weasel. Um, if any of those tests prove true in, in this sense, that they prove that accidental causes that know nothing about where they're going can invent something clever then that would be a refutation of the design claim. There are no such examples. And I give, I give these claimed examples, several of them in the book, and show one by one, none of them work. They're, they're, they're all false. So in that sense, it is refutable, but it won't be refuted because it's true. <laughs> so I also said, I think there's a basic, simple, logical argument, rational argument that everyone can get. It's not technical, that shows why that will never happen. Accident will never invent. I see. Okay, fine. So now I'll, I'll ask you a question that is more uh, psychological than empirical science. But nevertheless, I'm I'm just curious, and this is really, and I'm asking it because I'm puzzled by it. I don't have a full answer. Why, why do people want to believe that there is no design? That's a curious question. In the I think it's in the last chapter of my book. I um, I'm trying to turn to it right now. Yeah, it is in chapter 14. Richard Dawkins sponsored bus ads. You may have seen this in the news a couple of yeah, years ago. Yeah, in, in Britain, appeared mm -hmm. in London. Yeah. yeah, and and the ads. So these big banners appear on the sides of bus buses in London. Said, "There's probably no God. Now stop worrying and enjoy your life." And I have to admit, the first time I saw that, I, I thought, I don't even get. I don't even get the thought that's being conveyed there, because if someone were to convince me that there's no God, my life would go into crisis. Because right, I would start worrying. That's when I, I would start, start worrying. Yes. Right. So right, I, thought, that I don't it's, even understand yes, the logic of it's, it. That's right. It's um, but, yeah. but I've pondered a bit, and I think I think what's really being said there is I've found a way to do life, telling myself that there is no God. And part of that has involved me telling myself that this feeling of guilt I have for living life as though there is no God is, is false. And I can overwrite that guilt and I can suppress it and say, I'm not wrong to live this way. My life is my own. I think that must be what Dawkins is referring to. Once you've gone down that course... In other words, you're not being people, judged? Is that it? Yes, the idea that you you will not have to give account to anyone in your life. Yeah, that's what I th limited. I agree totally yeah. with you. I think that's behind it. Yeah, the people don't want to be judged, and that's what uh, that's ultimately what I think is involved here. Yep. So a question to you that I uh, and this is uh, you know a lot of times and totally understandably and it's valid. A lot of times an interviewer will ask a question that they, that they have an answer to in their minds, but they want to hear the person. I don't have an answer to this one. So I am, uh, I am truly asking you and just to see how you have grappled with it. So I, I believe in a designer, and I believe in design. So in light of that, and this is more of a theodicy question, a reconciling God and the suffering question, but nevertheless, so if we're designed... Why do there seem to be so many flaws in the design? Throughout history, I would say half the children who were born died before their first birthday. Doesn't right. that strike you as a flaw in the design? There's, I do address this in the book. There's different things that people can mean when they start to go down this road of asking why are things the way they are. One of them that I give as an example is the panda's thumb. So there are these things where you look at a healthy thing and say that's not the way an intelligent designer would design it. The panda, the, the giant panda you may know, has this thumb-like extension well, on the Well, wasn't that the name like, of one of Dawkins' books? The panda's um, thumb? Or, or, there's, some, there's, somebody, uh, or, or maybe... Uh, there's a website called the panda's oh, thumb. Oh, okay. All right. I don't know if there's a book. There may be. But this extension on the paw allows the, the panda to strip the leaves off of ban, bamboo for uh, eating for eating the leaves off bamboo. It's not a proper jointed thumb like ours, so it's not a true thumb. But there's this little bone extension that allows the panda to do that. 
So that's one example that's been put forward, and a lot of people have uh, invested much time and effort in writing and saying, here's an example of something that's not done the way a good designer would do it. All right, hold on. Perfect. Time for a break. We'll hear the answer when we come back. So I asked you a uh, sort of $64,000 question, and that is if it's designed... This is a big argument offered by the anti-design people, and it's an argument that does not strike me as absurd. I think a lot of absurdity in the anti-design world, but this is not one. Anyway, if it's designed, why do there seem to be so many flaws? And I gave the example of, until modern science, about half the babies born died before the age of one. So you were saying... I agree, first of all, that this is not an absurd objection. It's, it's a, a very weighty objection that needs to be answered very carefully. I address it in part in the book, and I kind of broke off two different avenues of critique here, and one is not uh, babies dying. Well, one of them is why is there so much brokenness and evil in the world, natural evil, diseases, cancer, uh, birth defects, etc. Another is to look at healthy things and say, why are they this way? This doesn't seem to be the way an intelligent designer would, would make them. With respect to that second one, I, I gave the panda's thumb as an example. By the way, Stephen and, Jay Gould did write a book, The Panda's yes, Thumb. Yes, I recalled that during the break. Yep. Gould did. <laughs> right. Uh, so my answer to that in the book is that when we critique something like that, we're placing ourselves in a position of a critic, a biocritic, I call it in the book. And I question whether anyone has risen to the level of understanding that would, that would make that position appropriate. In other words, when we look at a panda and say that's not the way a designer should have done it, it's as though we're saying, oh, and by the way, I've made things like pandas. Trust me, that's not the way an intelligent designer would do it. Since no one has risen to anything like that level of design, the very best human designs don't even touch pandas or any other living thing, I question whether anyone actually belongs in that seat of, uh, as a critic of living things. But that's separate from the question of uh, brokenness and evil, all the things that we see in, in the living world that we know are not right, and we all know that. There, that's a very deep question, and there I think the false logic that's sometimes put forward is if God is good and all-powerful, then there cannot be this kind of brokenness and evil in the world. And I would say that's not quite correct. What's the, the correct statement is if God is good and all-powerful, then a world where that brokenness and evil exists, which is this world, cannot be the final state of affairs. In other words, there will be an answer to this. If God is good and all-powerful, we're waiting for the answer. Okay. Uh, I... I... I accept that, but um, not both. I do accept it. Uh, the I guess the only alternative in any event, I, I when I have asked this question, I have then challenged myself and said, okay, so Dennis, well, all right, imagine that every single child ever born was perfectly healthy because that's your only alternative. So that means that in a designed world, the implication of that question is there can't be illness. And and then that does become a little odd. That means that God would only or the designer could only have made a utopia. Otherwise, there's no design. And that uh, that doesn't strike me as, as plausible either. So I, I think right. thinking with you through this that there really is an answer. And I accept yours entirely, and I assume that a big part of it is an afterlife. Correct? Correct. Yeah, yes. exactly. Do any schools today in America allow, from a purely scientific perspective, the teaching of design? Uh, colleges and universities? or Anything. <clears throat> well, as you know, it's a real hot button in public schools. My kids are all in public schools, and I think... People would have to tread very cautiously there. In colleges and universities, certainly private ones, there are ones that favor the design approach and teach that. Again, the public ones have to tread very cautiously, and I think the ones that I know of are teaching design or allowing discussion of design in philosophy courses, but probably not in life science courses. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. 
All right, let me go to some uh, calls here. And uh, this is uh, in Van Nuys, California, Ian. Hi, Ian. Dennis Prager with Douglas Axe. Hi. Hello, Dennis. Hello, Douglas. Um, I'm an atheist who is judged every day by people whose opinions matter to me. So I think it's ridiculous that you think I'd be worried about being judged by someone whose standard of morality is about on par with ISIS when in Leviticus 2013 he commands that we kill homosexuals. But the reason that I called is to put forth the experiment, I believe it was Lenski who did demonstrate that bacteria can evolve new function in the laboratory. It's been an ongoing experiment where bacteria were deprived of the food that they normally eat and given only a food which they were previously incapable of eating and they evolved the ability to digest that. It was a new biochemical function and they went back because they've been freezing each generation of bacteria and sequenced the DNA to find out exactly what changes were responsible for that. And I assume you've addressed it in your book, but I really haven't heard any science so far in this segment. I don't address that in the book. Actually, the intent of the book, I'm not sure we, we stated this, um, although I've spent 25 years doing technical work in critique of the Darwinian paradigm, the book actually is aimed at making a non-technical argument. And the reason for that is I just wanted more people to get why the Darwinian story doesn't work. Your example that you bring up, the Richard Lenski work, uh, 40,000 or maybe more now, like 50,000 generations of E. coli, is a great piece of work, far better than a lot of other pieces of work that have been trotted out as though they support Darwin's theory. In fact, though, there wasn't anything new invented. It was citrate metabolism, so these E. coli strain could not metabolize citrate. At the end of, I don't know how many tens of thousands of generations, they could metabolize citrate, but the machinery for doing that was already there. It was simply a latent set of genes that gets turned on by a metabolic switch. And in fact, although Lenski presented that as though doing a long-term evolution experiment uncovered something extraordinary, Scott Minnick at University of Idaho has replicated the same thing, got the same result in, I believe, under two weeks. So it is not at all an invention. It's a very simple switch. It can be flipped over very quickly. It was simply an, the difference between Minnick's work and Lenski's was that uh, Lenski did daily, or Lenski's graduate students, or whoever did this, did daily dilutions and re-inoculations, and Minnick let these things sit in what's called stationary phase for extended period, and you get the same thing very quickly. So there's no remarkable invention at all. In all right. Key. I'm sure it, uh, Ian is, uh, Ian, you convinced now? Uh, Th there's papers written no. But, I'm uh, sorry, what? I, I appreciate the attempt. Okay, good. Uh, so now let me answer your uh, little crack uh, at uh, Leviticus. Uh, do you believe okay. that uh, Western civilization has been morally superior to all others? Um, I think in some ways the current Western civilization is morally superior to... Uh, what civilization other than the West abolished slavery or created human rights or democracy? Can you name any? Uh... Okay, so the answer is the I same assume, book that you I, I crapped that, on uh, is the, the book. Chinese who have no, the Chinese didn't. no longer have no, slaves no, okay. to abolish slavery as well. No, no, yeah. Now, there's, now they have. Okay. Anyway, look, I, I, I could spend the hour with you. I don't want to take it away from Douglas Axe. Everybody has this this line from the Bible that they love to throw out, whether it's homosexuals or kids who were rebellious. Uh, meanwhile, it is that book. Leviticus and Numbers and Exodus and Genesis and Deuteronomy and the rest of the Bible that made the, the civilization that made human rights possible and it all emanated from that. There was no other book on earth that said love the stranger. Okay, so a little perspective is always very helpful. Gee, it produced the best civilization in the world, but the book is crappy. It's not, not tenable. Hi, everybody. Dennis Prager here. Final segment with Douglas Axe. His very readable book based on a lifetime of research. Undeniable. How biology confirms our intuition that life is designed. We live in a strange age, if I may editorialize personally for a moment. 
an age that really does believe that it is more logical to believe that everything came about by chance. One day, I am of this I am truly convinced, one day we will be regarded as one of the strangest periods in the history of the world, that the entire or nearly the entire intellectual world was dominated by the belief that everything happened on its own. In, in that regard, uh, the, uh, you, you know, your, your book is undeniable. It could, have, it could have been the obverse of it, if you will, improbable. It, it could have been the title, and the book is showing how improbable it is that everything was, was done by, uh, by coincidence. So much so that uh, I have had uh, scientists on who now actually believe that it is so improbable that life, let alone intelligent life, evolved on its own that there wasn't just, there simply hasn't been enough time in this universe, so now they posit that there are an infinite number of universes to get around it. Indeed. I, I mean, that's really, that's, which they acknowledge can never ever be proven or disproven. There cannot be contact with another universe. So they are positing something that is literally unprovable and undisprovable and then they but they laugh at us who who think that life suggests a designer i do take that idea on in the book and actually show that what we see here on planet earth is totally inconsistent with uh the idea that it arose here because there are an infinite number of universes so although you can't prove or disprove whether there are other universes you can show that that hypothesis does not explain what we see here the book, my friends, is undeniable, and it's undeniably good. How biology confirms our intuition that life is designed. Douglas Axe, it has been a real pleasure. Thank you so much. You're very welcome.